Hi folks, Steve here, and let's talk uh, this Nick Broomfield film, Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer. As you can see from the promotional poster, uh, the film was very positively received across a number of festivals and you know, winning um, a number of awards um, sort of shortly um, after its release. Um, it's also the film that is sort of the the inspiration, um, not so much for the for the film monster, but certainly the inspiration for um, the sort of the performance of Eileen Warnos, where in that film you have um, characters kind of doing impersonations of a, a number of people that appear across this documentary. What's really interesting about this poster is the way that it uses uh, a young um, uh, image of Eileen. So this is the the young image here presented on the television screen is Eileen as a child. And it's interesting because when you look at this image, if you didn't know anything about this film, you would think that the image that you're looking at is actually the victim, not the villain. And the whole film is really pushing this argument that had Eileen had different circumstances, that perhaps, just perhaps, she would have had a, um, you know, she would have been able to be a, a good, decent citizen. Um, but instead, you know, she she had a number of things not go her way. Um, she was completely traumatised. She suffered from serious mental health issues. And um, as a result, she sort of turned serial killer. So it is interesting, this film, and of oh, this poster, rather, in the way that also it kind of sets up this whole idea that what we're going to see across the film is the the life story of Eileen Warnos from child to killer. And the question I would ask really is, does the film effectively trace her background and childhood? It alludes to it at a couple of times. We see a couple of these um, sort of family photographs, but the film really doesn't go into any detail um, tracing her background and her childhood and think about the way that the film is set up think about whether that is a problem of the film certainly is it a problem of the film wanting us to empathize with Eileen um, so the film was made by Nick Broomfield and it's it's worth talking about Nick Broomfield up front because he's he is sort of the star of the film alongside Eileen Warnos. Um, and he's kind of got this, uh, this sort of approach, which is that, you know, that traditional sort of observational style. He's very much in the shots. He, you, his voiceover is heard across the film. Um, when he is interviewing someone, he's heard interviewing them. He's also seen interviewing them. Think about how the camera is constantly looking at Nick Broomfield um, and it's not just about the, his subjects. He, in a way, the film is about him. And what's interesting about the film is the way that you get this sort of, um, uh, you know, his political um, stance on particular things is is very, very clear. I mean, you've got this... Um, you got this uh, lady in the documentary who, who sort of, you know, she's talking about, um, you know, gay people, gay kids. And she's like, oh, well, you know, they, were, they weren't gay kids when I was at school. They just didn't exist. And, you know, Nick Broomfield is, you know, the first to sort of correct her and say, well, no, the world has always existed with gay people. I think it's you who just doesn't want to acknowledge the existence um, up to a particular date. But, you know, that's what Nick is always about. He's about, you know, putting forward his agenda with particular things. Certainly with the death penalty, um, you, you know, the film is about the problems of the death penalty and the film is about the, the cent centrally the problem of putting um, insane people to death when they actually don't know what's happening to them, which is the law is if someone is um, proven to be um, critical uh, uh, criminally insane that they 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 shouldn't be put to death. They should only be put to death if they're lucid and aware of actually what's going on. So um, 
you know, it's it's interesting um, the way that Nick Broomfield is so um, involved in the film, and um, some people have uh, you know cri- criticised his style, and also believe that Eileen, the documentary here, is not nearly as effective as um, someone who sort of would have stood back a little bit. Um, so other people have also criticised the film for Nick Broomfield being a man and him interviewing Eileen Warnos and that she was not willing to open up um, regarding particular issue, regarding p- particular issues of her past that perhaps a, a female director, you know, she would have been more comfortable with a female. Like, let's face it, Eileen's problems, um, well, one of her problems uh, is actually, you know, the problems she's had with men and men in her life. Um, so that's that's certainly something um, to think about when you're watching the film. Now, when you're watching the film, right, I want you to think about Nick's uh, relationship with the social actors, right? With Eileen, he pretty much, he talks to her one-to-one very intimately. You know, he's there, he's he's sort of looking out for her, which asks the question when we're asking a question about ethics is the question about, there's a moment in the film when he's interviewing her and um, then the interview finishes and she thinks the camera's not rolling, there's no... Um, way that what she's saying can be recorded and she starts to talk to Nick about things that she had refused to mention in the documentary so it was kind of that the off the record interview bit you know where it's like I'll tell you off the record but don't put this in the film kind of thing and the cameraman picks up the camera and uh, starts filming uh, Nick interviewing Eileen and Eileen talking about these things Eileen has no idea this is being recorded. Eileen has no idea it's going to be in the film because conveniently for the film, she died. She was executed before the film was released. So again, it is able to do particular things with Eileen and her representation because she is dead and she can't actually challenge that. So have a think about that and the film and the way that it, it depicts Eileen in a particular way and represents her in a particular way and that they didn't actually need consent because by the time the film came out, she was dead. And the film kind of knows that and is aware of that. So um, have a think about that. With a lot of the social actors, Nick Broomfield does challenge them and they're often the social actors who he, he wants to do this sort of victim-villain um, sort of sort of representation or um, structure, which is, you know, it's actually very similar to a film like, um, you know, like Amy, the Amy Winehouse documentary, where you've got, you've got the, 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 the um, documentary filmmaker deciding who's going to be the victim, who's going to be the villain. And what's interesting is with both those films, if you want to compare them, is the way that the the way that the media has portrayed these particular women as um, well, kind of villains of their own de- demise, really, or you know, orchestrators of their own demise. Um, these these filmmakers are actually saying, no, actually, it's more complicated than that. And in fact, they were somewhat um, victimized um, by their own circumstances. Um, there's a, a scene early in the film when because this um, film is sort of based on an earlier documentary that Nick Broomfield did. This film is much better. Um, Life and Death of a Serial Killer is much better than his earlier film, which he did a decade earlier, um, which was The Selling of a Serial Killer. And in Life and Death of a Serial Killer, you actually get uh, more more um, interviews with Eileen Warnos. Um, but it's, it's interesting to know that um, there was an earlier film. And what's interesting about the earlier film is there's a lot of scenes of Nick... I mean, the thing about um, Selling of a Serial Killer, it's like it's a documentary about wanting to make a documentary, right? So you've got Nick Broomfield going around trying to interview these people who are really close to Eileen Warnos, and all they're wanting to do is is initiate conversations about money 
and will they be paid and how much will they be paid and when will they get the money and you know all of this is going on and it's really interesting when we're talking about social actors directly asking for money and something we've looked at across this course is the problems of social actors being paid and how that ethically actually compromises the film in question and in um there's a scene early when Nick Brimfield is actually asked to give evidence based on his earlier film, and he's actually being asked direct questions about paying the social actors and um, you know why that's a problem, and he sort of has to answer those questions of why it's a problem, um, which I think is really really interesting. So think about all the social actors depicted in this film. Certainly Nick Brimfield, who is who depicts himself as somewhat of a hero, where he's come to save the day, he's come to really question um, the death penalty. So it, it, you know, it is a film that would share similarities to another film, like, um, or say, uh, um, you know, Thin Blue Line would be a film that you would certainly um, compare in, a, in an interesting way, more than in a direct way. So there is no separation between the filmmaker. Um, Eileen is always aware of the camera, and I think that, well... She's not always aware of the camera, like I just said. There's one moment when she's not actually aware of the camera, and that ethically asks a lot of questions and raises a lot of problems. It's interesting because um, if, if you're actually talking about the thin blue line, where you've got this confession in the thin blue line, when the camera wasn't rolling because the camera had jammed that day, so it was being recorded on a tape recorder, and the social actor in that instance seemed to be more willing to actually talk the truth. Now, what Eileen's talking about is it's not the confession, really, because she's, she's quite happy to confess, right? But it is something about um, that she's more open with Nick Broomfield when the camera is actually on her. Now, what's interesting is the way that she interacts with the camera. She's always looking at the camera. Even when she's in um, the courtroom, right, she's... She knows where the cameras are and she's looking at them. She's playing up to the camera. She's performing an idea of herself, this her own persona. And I think that's that's fascinating. It 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 makes us think of um, you know, of other films like say a Forbidden Lies, where you've also got you know, these social actors playing up particular things to the camera, playing up particular ideas of the, of themselves. And the film gives Eileen this space to do this. She gives Eileen the um, appropriate um, room to do this. Now, um, okay, there's a, there, there are problems with the film that some people have pointed out. And um, one of the problems, and I'll be interested to know what you think about this, is the, the somewhat occasional and almost disjointed and somewhat schematic uh, tabloid tone to certainly to Broomfield's voiceover and think about the voiceover and how it's there and why it's there. So this is his voiceover when this is near the start. He says, Eileen age six left Michigan and traveled down here to Florida looking for son and friends. She was young and pretty and earning good money as a hooker, but with a violent temper and, and soon in trouble. She knocked one man out with a beer bottle, another with a billiard ball. She particularly liked it here near Daytona beach. This is one of the motels, the Fairview, where she frequently stayed. It was all so new and exciting. So he sets up, um, you know, this is, we're going to see the history of Eileen Warnos. We're going to hear the, the history of Eileen Warnos. But he's also setting it up in this, as um, Tana um, Horik uh, says, you know, this is the stuff of true crime and pulp fiction. And the risk is that it tends to, towards... Um, lurid redescription rather than critical investigation. Does the film critically investigate Eileen? What went on um, with those with those killings, and also just the state of the media that Horrock believes that Nick Broomfield actually gets so caught up in Eileen Warnos, he actually stops doing his job as a documentary filmmaker. And is the do job of the documentary filmmaker here to be investigating the film in a more intimate way than he does? Okay, so it's a tip. It's an atypical serial killer documentary, I would say. It it's 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 sort of working within the tradition of social concern. Like here, you've got a documentary filmmaker who's actually saying, 
Well, here's my subject, but I'm going to inter intervene with the subject. I'm going to try and champion the subject to a better life. And you see that in films also like Born into Brothels, um, The Thin Blue Line, where he's working within that tradition of social concern. Now, uh, Broomfield has said that life and death is an attempt to bring public attention to the injustice of the death penalty and the inhumanity of the state in putting a mentally disturbed individual to death. Right? So his whole, the whole point of his documentary is to depict Eileen Warnos as mentally disturbed. Think about that. How is she represented as mentally disturbed? Think certainly how he frames her, how he uses the close-up of her, and how he's really, really interested in her, kind of her crazy rants. And a lot of the questions, a lot of the questions he asks her are really pushing this this she, you know he's trying to push the edge he's trying to get a response from her and again what sort of problems does that have in you know eth ethics and documentary but um what i would say is unlike most serial killer documentaries which fetishizes the killings and the killer and you know all of that it, it's not really interested in that at all it, it's about humanizing eileen warnos i mean when i say humanizing her I mean humanising her in a way of she's this crazy mad person, that sort of humanising way. But it doesn't just sort of say as, you know, what happens with a lot of serial killer documentaries is they are they are the evil and they will be treated as the evil. They're not actually given a, a hum, humanistic um, perspective, which I think um, is really not, tr you know, true for this documentary. And what comes across is the extent of Warnos's mental disturbance. Um, but you know there have been problems, um, more problems with like Paige Schiltz, who says this. He does not provide viewers with the tools to critique the gender, sexual, and class biases embedded in dominant media images of Warnos. The omission of an, an analytical or critical framework effectively reinforces dominant ideas of Warnos as a white trash woman who killed, or a woman who killed because she was white trash. What he meant, what what um, what Paige means by this is you've got the media image of Eileen, and you've got the Nick Broomfield image of Eileen, and she's actually arguing that the two aren't that far removed. Now, I think that's interesting, and it's you you could actually make a claim that 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 is true. I still believe that he humanizes her in ways that other people don't, and. Part of this humanising, of course, is the fact that he actually gets to talk to her, where so many media, um, you know, representatives do not. Um, but think about that. Think about the way that he critiques gender, sexual, and class, and what's going on there, and whether um, the Eileen Warnos of the Nick Broomfield documentary is actually that different to the other Eileen Warnosses, and of course. The um, the film monster would you know, be very influenced by this film. Now, with all of um, Bill Nichols' modes, this is one film where I would actually say to you that it covers all five modes. All five modes are here to some degree in the film. All right, and I'll, I'll just quickly, very quickly work through them now, but we can sort of unpack them later. So it's got a voiceover that addresses the audience. Nick Broomfield talks in this sort of voice of God. He's sort of got this voice of God commentator thing going on. He uses images to illustrate the voiceover, absolutely. And he, he talks about the editing for continuity. Um, and he uses, uh, he uses a variety of footage from this film. He uses a variety of footage from his earlier film and also media images and things like that. The observational conventions are, uh, you know, obvious that he's walking around with his camera, observing people. Um, sometimes, you know, sometimes he's just observing people. He's not actually directly interacting with them through um, interviews and things like this. This isn't um, a as apparent because, you know, the voiceover is so dominant, but you, you really do get a sense of it here. And the documentary maker's presence is hidden. Um, certainly in that, that scene I was telling you about, when Island doesn't think she's being recorded, you could actually claim that, that is an observational convention. Um, the participatory or interactive conventions, so the way that he is interacting with his subjects, the way that interviews dominate 
the the film, but they tend to be done kind of informally. The earlier documentary, Selling of a Serial Killer, is all about setting up interviews that never actually happen, right? So that this film, you actually get some interviews. But again, it's actually about Nick Broomfield talking to people in a very sort of informal way, as if the two of them had just met. Um, performative conventions, absolutely. Eileen is the performer of the film, and she plays it up for the camera. And Nick Broomfield also plays it up for the camera, which, again, I think is really, really interesting. And the reflexive conventions, the Burroughs techniques from the fiction film or an for an emotional subjective response, it emphasises the expressive nature of film. Um, it doesn't do reenactments, but it's if you think about the voiceover, right? It's like it is questioning and uncertain um, in particular parts, and that's the interesting thing about this film. In some parts, he talks in this. This is my opinion. This is the way it is in this very direct way. But when he's actually talking about Eileen Warnos the person, what's inside her head, he's talking in a far less authoritative way, which again is there to create empathy for her. And this is relying more on his beliefs, his suggestions rather than his facts. And just a final thought, um, so Jane Malcolm's um, really great book, The Journalist and the Murderer, says, if any journalist is honest with themselves, they'll admit that they are lying to their subject. So is Nick Broomfield lying to his subject? And she goes and say they make the subject think that they are going to recreate the subject's true story. Do we get the true story of Eileen Warnos in this film? Right? Is the film um, comprehensive? Is it biased? Is it too biased? Think about that film when you're watching it. Think when you walk away to think. Well, I actually now I just want to see like a proper, you know documentary on Eileen Warnos, which isn't just this sort of political agendered one. So think about that. How do you feel about Eileen by the end? And how does the film want you to feel about Eileen? And do these two match? Right? Does how the film is wanting you to think about it and how you are thinking about it, do those two things match? Do you think differently about Eileen Warnos from the start? When the start is he's driving down this road and he's looking through his windscreen and Nick Broomfield says, you know, this is where it happened. This is where, you know, the bodies were murdered, you know, in this sort of tabloid kind of way. And then it kind of goes away from that. And it's actually about Eileen, the person, the individual, the victimized person. And again, you know, in the sort of the last third of the film, it really becomes about the problems of the death penalty and his own political agendas regarding that, which again, you know, has this really direct link to um, those earlier death penalty problem films like, you know, The Thin Blue Line being the most famous. All right, I'll leave it there. Um, Eileen, Life and Death of a Serial Killer, uh, very, very famous, very, very influential film, and uh, Nick Broomfield is considered one of the most important contemporary document documentary uh, filmmakers uh, working in Britain, and also uh, yeah, another point to think about is also the fact that he's British and he's making a, a film which is very an American film, American film about... Um, uh, well, an American person, but also this American institution of the death penalty. All right, leave it there. See you soon.